My time has finally come. I remembered watching them walk into the great hall when I was a boy. Always at night, my door slightly ajar, and I'd first be woken up by the soft chanting. My nanny would try to keep me inside my room, but it was no use. They would walk past with their red robes, a sword at their sides, and even through it I could tell who my parents were. Their walk, build, and mannerisms are the same. My father is determined to get to action, and my mother softer and slower. I wasn't supposed to watch any part of this. One of the figures, my father, would stop, and the golden gargoyle mask would turn in my direction. The teeth were bared with large, pointed fangs and twisted demonic eyes. A black-gloved hand would gesture for me to close the door and to go back to bed. I'd nod my head, close the door, and then wait until he would walk away before I'd open it up again. When the last cult member walked through, they'd closed the doors, and I was excluded. Whenever I'd try to bring it up to them, my parents would ignore the question or deflect, acting as though I'd had a child's vivid imagination. When I was a teenager, my father told me once, and only once, I will tell you when I am older. Do not try to interfere with our plans. You will know when the time is right. After that, I waited until both my 16th and my 18th birthdays. Nothing happened. By this point, I figured it was some weird upper-class inbred bullshit that I wanted no part in. I focused on my friends, studies, and travel. There was a whole world to explore. My parents' ancestral estate no longer gave me a sense of pride. It was too... big. Nearly gaudy. Finally, after one of many trips overseas, I returned back home. There was no special date that I'm aware of. No full moon or any other possible reason for the change. I don't know what message they received to let them know it was finally time. I woke up to both my parents standing in my room and jumped, asking them what the hell they were doing. They didn't break eye contact. It's time for you to join us, son. He greeted me, the pride clear in his voice. I don't want to. Let me... I couldn't finish my sentence before a fist hit my face. I never knew he had so much strength in him. Normally, cordial, polite, even a coward despite whatever was thrown at him. This is the greatest honor you could ever achieve. He struck me harder this time, and I tasted blood. Before I knew it, he pulled me out of bed, and I landed hard on the floor with him looking down at me. Normally, gentle blue eyes were cold, steady, and his lips were a thin line, his bottom jaw firmly tucked beneath the lower one. The urge to fight back was strong, yet the disbelief that this was happening was stronger. If you don't do it, you can say goodbye to it all. I will disinherit you. Fine. I'll join. I glared up at him venomously, with blood in my teeth, unwilling to let go of my comfortable, privileged life. My mother gave the pair of us a bored, dismissive look and tapped my father's shoulder. That's enough, dear. I agreed. He let me go and told me this evening I would be presented to the head of the order. He opened the door, letting it hit the wall, and didn't turn back to close it. My mother didn't say anything. She frowned, her hands tightening, and gave me a reassuring smile when I looked at her. Her dyed blonde bob framed her face. Her eyes were narrow. Worried. And already she had her makeup on. I don't recall a time ever seeing her without it. She opened her mouth, perhaps going to offer me some wisdom, and closed it before she left and gently closed the door behind her. I never discovered what she was going to say. What did they do to make them behave this way? I went into the ensuite and showered to get ready. For the first time, my parents were like strangers, and sure, they were always distant. Preferring for the more frustrating parts of rearing me to nannies and other members of the help, I was drying off when my mother handed me a white robe. Do I really have to do this? She smiled sadly at me, cupped my cheeks and studied my face. I will help you. Your father and I only want what's best for you. She didn't care what I thought and wanted to keep up appearances. 
I returned a polite, courteous smile, and she gave me a rare hug. I held her petite frame. I could smell her perfume, and it reminded me of fresh flowers. In my ear, she whispered, You'll become a man tonight. I froze, unsure and wary as she broke the embrace. She strode out the door and left me as alone as I felt. I sat on my bed in my white robe, then stood up to gaze out the window. I couldn't make it down the five-story levels, not alive at least. Three loud, booming knocks echoed through the room. The door opened, and a man with a golden mask of a grotesque demon, fangs bared and teeth ready to strike. He held a large cane with an eagle's talon on the foot. In this year, tonight you begin your journey into the Order. The voice boomed, near deafening me. Ten of the members circled me, standing close enough for me to touch them if I wished. They were all cloaked and masked, the same way as the leader. Kneel. The last thing I wanted to do was kneel. I sank from one knee to another, exhaled, and bowed my head. Do you agree to service with full obedience? Yes, I answered knowing what I was supposed to say. Do you agree to uphold and protect your brothers? Yes. All of it sounded fairly tame so far. Will you keep our secrets, even under the pain of death? Yes. I kept my head bowed in submission. I shivered, seeing their shadows around my feet, and wondered what would occur if I did something wrong. Would this brotherhood be more important than me? I hoped my parents' parental instincts would protect me. I felt the white robe be pulled away, leaving me naked, and I bit my bottom lip in anger, frightened for what might occur, and loosened it. It is time for you to prove it. Stand. I stood. The remnants of the robe fell down, and the urge to cover myself was strong. Why didn't they warn me about this part? The head man tilted his masked head to the side and held the cane horizontally. He pulled one end and revealed a concealed sword. The blade shone, and it looked incredibly sharp. The tip pressed right above my belly button. I could feel the warmth of the blood trickle down, and my breathing was rapid. I settled myself, lifted my chin, fought to lift my gaze to look at them, and waited for what would come. The sword didn't move. Step forward. If I did, it meant I would die. Painfully so. I was in no position to refuse. What would happen to my parents if I did? Maybe even a slow death was better than enduring the rest of theirs. I stepped forward, eyes open and glaring into the masked face, and expected my body to be pierced. While the tip still pressed against me, it moved backward as I stepped forward and lowered to his side. My blood dripped down onto the carpet. Well done. You have shed blood for your brothers, and now must bring three. One through love, one through deceit, and one through hatred. Trust me, we will know. You will spill their blood. No executing a simple wrongdoer. He warned me preemptively before I had a chance to think about it. He towered over us, the booming voice loud, and I thought at one point his eyes would glow behind the mask. They never did. I stared at them, waiting and hoping for a punchline that didn't come. I didn't know what I was supposed to say. He cleared his throat, and finally asked, Do you accept your task? As though I was a simpleton. Yes. You have three days to complete your task. Bring them to the main hall, and you will know what to do. He said, turned and strode out of the room. The others moved out of the way and bowed their heads to him. He left. No goodbyes or anything else. Eight of the rest followed him, except two. My parents, and my mother closed the door to give me some privacy. Too late to be of use. I picked the robe off the floor angrily, and held it in front of me. I breathed inward, ready to unleash vitriol on them, only to be interrupted. Be quiet. Don't speak. 
My father grabbed my arm, while my mother listened at the door to ensure no one ever heard us. I never imagined anyone trying this inside the house, or my father tolerating this. You need to do this. Don't lie. They will know. I... I really have to kill someone. Yes. Don't worry. You're on your way. It's a good thing. My mother removed her mask, took me by the shoulders, and smiled. A happy tear in her eye. Why was she so happy? My father didn't turn to look at me. Son, you have three days. Be discreet, and you will have help. You may already know people who may be suitable. Don't worry about the help. They won't get in the way. My father looked out the same window I stared out of moments before. My fingers rested on my wound. It nearly stopped bleeding, and it still stung. I don't know if I want to. This time he grabbed me, slammed my back on the wall, and his face was inches from mine. We have bled for you to have this opportunity. He spat, the spittle striking my face, and he hissed through clenched teeth. This was the second time he had ever behaved like this. My mother sighed irritably. Ethan, stop it. You look foolish. And my father sheepishly shrugged, stepping away, letting her take the lead. Son, darling, your father has worked hard for you. If you do well, someday when you're experienced, you will take up his mantle and lead us. Do you understand? She cupped my cheeks in her hands, her face uncomfortably close to mine, and I nodded in compliance to get her to stop, still unable to imagine my father leading anything. Her eyes shone with the power she craved, that she couldn't have herself, but could wield through me. They left. I thought more about it. One through love. One through deceit. One through hate. I figured hate would be easy enough. Three people. Three living souls. I quickly got dressed, grabbed my phone on the way out, and headed toward my car. It was parked in the usual spot, along with many others my parents owned. Each of them is expensive, at my father's pride and joy. I could have requested the driver, even late notice, but I needed to get away from here. I yearned to be alone. I wanted to call my girlfriend to tell her what was going on, but if I told her, it put her in danger. If my parents were scared, then I wondered what they would do to my working-class girlfriend, who they barely tolerated and referred to as sowing my wild oats. I got in the car, drove down the long driveway, and waited for the automatic gate to open. I was going to call her when I saw a broken mask on the front seat beside me. I couldn't do it to her. Who was worthy of being killed? I needed to find someone so repulsive I couldn't look away. A pedophile. Someone who hurts children, animals, and women. There was a pimp in town who had a reputation to procure anything someone desired. He had managed to escape the law on multiple occasions. The perfect target. I parked close by where he was supposed to be, without weapons or anything to defend myself. What the fuck was I doing here? I heard an unfamiliar beep and checked my phone. The icon showed the mask. I opened it and read, Good choice. Go in and get him. Bring him to the car. Everything you need is in the trunk. I stared at it. Clearly they were watching me. I looked through my car for any sign of cameras or microphones. There was probably a tracker somewhere, or one of their ranks was watching me. I sighed, blinked, and the message was gone. I got out, opened the boot, and there was a bag, weapons, rope, basically anything a would-be kidnapper or murderer would need to take their next target. I closed it quickly. Perhaps I could kill two birds with one stone. If I deceived him, surely that would count as number two, and I wouldn't have three people's deaths on my conscience. I walked toward the building, without a plan, and the doorman stopped me. I, I'd like to speak to Mr. Dodd. Do you have a meeting with him? Uh, no, I, I, I don't. 
Uh, however, I have a business proposal for him that is both uh, discreet and profitable. He let out an unimpressed grunt. I couldn't see his eyes through the black shades and knew he was judging me. If he loses it, it'll be on your head. I answered with more grits than I had ever had before. He stiffened, spoke in a low voice into a headset with his back half turned to me. I could hear them talking, but couldn't understand the muffled words. Sir, right this way, top right hand door. I noticed the change in tone and entered. The music greeted me. The scene surrounding me was filled with bodies in various positions, moving and moaning. I tried not to look. The sounds of lust were irresistible. I had to straighten my jacket and focus on the task at hand. I walked past a woman, too young, dressed in the same manner as the other participants. Her eyes glazed over, and a dead, vacant expression in her eyes. She tried to take me by the hands to lead me to one of the beds. She didn't belong here. How many others weren't supposed to be here? A man took her hand and led her away. What people did in their own time was their own business. I was taken into a large room, invited to sit across from an extravagant desk, and sat on an enormous leather chair. Two girls left as I entered, and I had to fight everything in me not to kill him then and there. All the display flashed the wealth and power he wished to portray. To someone accustomed to the finer things in life, it came off cheap. Nouveau riche. New money. Across from me sat a man whose family was one or two generations out of the mines, so to speak. His jaw lined with stubble, his features otherwise moderately attractive by conventional standards, and other than the knowledge of his crimes and that pompous, irritating smirk on his face, he wouldn't have been memorable. Ah, I believe I know your parents. I didn't want to know how or why he knew them. If he wasn't lying, he would be in for a shock. Uh, fortunately for you, this will make this go quicker. I'm planning an event with multiple esteemed guests and will require discretion. He leaned back in his chair and had the audacity to place his feet on the table, crossed his legs, and sat back. I didn't feel guilty about killing him. Why'd you calm yourself? I'm sure a man of your position could send some trusted help over. I paused, inclined my head to the right side, and waited for him to dismiss the bodyguards. I was left waiting, the subtle hints unknown to him. I cleared my throat, gesturing to the staff, and finally, it clicked what I wanted. He gave an arrogant flick of his hand, and they stepped out. I figured they would be listening in. I didn't trust him. Um, since you know my parents, you'll know they only conduct business in person. There are others who can procure what is needed. Getting your foot in the door is an opportunity. I continued, in an attempt to dangle the carrot over his head. Unfortunately for me, he wasn't so quick to buy it. Why come to visit me yourself? I want to assess you to see how you conduct yourself. Do you have the goods? Are you discreet? And most importantly, can you be trusted? My parents can open up doors for you if you please them, and I can make that happen for you. His right lip curled, his hands rested casually on his head, and I couldn't wait to slice open his arrogant throat and... Fair enough. Where will the meeting take place? Now. I have a car outside. Just you. Nobody else. He stiffened at this, his arms folded across his chest, and that cocky smirk dropped. We need to trust you. You're coming to our home. Greed won over caution. I stood, not waiting for his answer. He took the bait and followed close behind. I heard him quicken his pace. I couldn't believe that it actually worked. He followed me. I heard him pause and tell one of his bodyguards that he was coming out. The bodyguard didn't trust me. Sir, are you sure? Oh, don't question it, Johnny. He said, leaning close. This will be a moneymaker. I didn't react, giving the impression that I wasn't listening. We walked out to my car, and he sat in the passenger seat. We drove away, and I didn't notice any cars following me. They were quiet on the drive. 
What was I supposed to say to a dead man? When we came to the driveway, I saw his eyes light up. He smiled, and I could tell he imagined the home being his. Beautiful home you have here. I've driven past, but never got a chance to get close. I parked. The pair of us got out of the car and walked toward the grand entrance. It was quiet. The help was nowhere to be found, and I unlocked the door. He walked into the foyer, with two large spiral staircases on either side, and he couldn't hide it now. He walked in, and he owns the place, perhaps thinking of blackmail or some other scam he could use to gain it. Uh, right this way. Uh, apologies. My mom decided to give the help some time off. He nodded, waved his hand dismissively, and I opened the grand hall door for him. He walked through without thanks, clearly believing this was for him, and found an empty house. Incense had been lit, with the flanks lined with tall red and black pillar candles. I closed the doors. With a click, they locked behind me, and he strode through. His pace slowed, and he turns to look at me, his eyes wide with fright, before narrowing in anger. What's going on? One through hatred. I growled. The other cult members, led by the head man, walked out in the distance, their masks glittering through the smoke, and I looked around for a weapon. With none, I walked toward him and punched him as hard as I could. He ducked and then punched me in the stomach and was a better street fighter than I was. The other cult members didn't come to help me and I didn't expect them to. Together we fell to the ground, punching each other, and I knew I would tire before he would. I gave him one sharp, sudden throat punch, and he choked, his hand around his throat, gasping for breath. I seized my opportunity. I leapt at him, pushing him to the ground and strangling him with my bare hands. He kicked at me, trying to push me off, and I heard chanting behind me. The shadows and light swayed from side to side. He choked, eyes bulged, and I stared down into them. When life left his eyes, I realized the appeal. When his body lay limp, the head man walked toward me and placed his hand on my shoulder. It is done. Only two more for you. So, it only counted for one. I panted and rolled onto the floor on my back. I could taste and smell the blood. I was seen. People will... The mask tilted. A mocking laugh answered me. We own the police. You did society a great service. He held his hand up to the sky, reached behind his mask, and lifted it up. I didn't recognize him. His hand rested on my shoulder. I'm proud of you. You're doing better than I expected. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw my father already indulging in the alcohol, avoiding looking at us, and my mother hooked her arm around the headman's elbow, practically beaming up at him. You need to bring two others, and they shirt. The first one is always the hardest. I watched as two cult members dragged the corpse to the middle of the room. The veins were sliced open allowing the blood to pool inside large caskets, and using cleavers, they chopped up the body. Killing wasn't so bad. Seeing this, I covered my mouth and vomited on the floor. My mother tuttered her tongue in displeasure, eyed me disapprovingly, and walked toward the blood. She beckoned me to come closer with her finger. I walked and stood by her, the stray pool of blood surrounding my shoes. Her hands reached down, cupping the blood in her hand, and painted my cheeks in the blood. You're rising, my son. Soon, you will take your father's place. She whispered, turned my head toward the head man, the priest. My fears are now realized. How she behaved with him, how similar I looked and I connected the dots. The smoke grew heavy, and my legs gave out beneath me. I could hear screaming, many hands pulling on me. The faces were twisted and contorted. I couldn't understand what they were saying. 
There was screaming and pleads of all of those who had been killed, betrayed, and I saw his face. He was angry, hurting, and it pulled me from my remorse. I woke up in my head with fresh bandages on my wounds. My head throbbed. I rested the flat of my hand on my forehead, and my clothes had been changed. I purposely ignored how this happened, and the thought of who changed me. I went toward the ensuite, gazed into my eyes, and I expected to see a resemblance of a monster. My eyes were the same. A person's. Two more to go. The person I hated was easy. I felt good about removing someone so vile. My father knocked on the door and entered. His eyes red, face drawn in, and he looked like he had been crying for hours. Not that he would ever admit it to me. We cleared it up for you. Don't worry about a murder charge or anything. He gave a sad smile and was about to leave before I stopped him. I wanted to ask if I was actually his son or if my mother was just lying. Why was he involved in all of this? I didn't. I pulled him into a hug. He paused, and after a moment, hugged me in return. It didn't matter if he was my father, but he was definitely my dad. He smiled when the hug broke, happy tears in his eyes, and he looked up at me. The perfect target. Thank you, son. I... Well, I guess I needed that. He headed toward the door. What happens if I follow through? Do I have to worry about the law? No, your job is to take lives. All the cleanup is done by the rest of us. You're safe, son. Don't worry about it. He tapped the door frame and left. Thank you, Dad. I added the memories of his fond yet distant upbringing. Deceit. I had two in mind. I made no preparations. I asked the personal chef to cook my favorite foods and sat outside in the vast manicured gardens, taking in the sunlight. I waited out here, and the sound of frantic sandals tapped along, and I knew it was her before I saw her. I lifted my shades and saw my mother glaring down at me, coldly. Why are you out here? Shouldn't you be planning? She asked, an artificial eyebrow raised and a hand rested on her hip. A grumble came from her lips. She wrapped her arms around me and yanked me into an embrace. You did so well yesterday. I knew you had it in you. I, I, uh, thank you. You need two more. Once that happens, you will become a full member, and I'll get rid of my false father. She stopped, stunned, and looked like she mentally searched for when and how she managed to reveal her little secret. I pulled her close, pointed to my father speaking to the gardener about some trivial matter or another. I will get rid of my false father, I repeated, and she got the hint grabbed my face and kissed my cheek a little too close to my mouth and let out a squeal of happiness. Once she was gone, I wiped my cheek with disgust and waited until nightfall. I went back into my room to get my initiate robe. Seated comfortably on my bed was the head man without a mask and his robe and wore a sash of nobility, a short cropped beard, sea green eyes and the resemblance was even more clear. Oh, I wanted to speak to you before your big day. Have you selected your target? You haven't left the house. He questioned, critically, and I sat beside him. I felt uncomfortable at how he chose my bed to sit on rather than the different chairs available. I took the invasion of privacy as a warning. They could reach me anywhere I felt safe. I have chosen both of them. Ah, oh, yes. Care to share? He gave me an overly familiar nudge that irritated me. No. I thought to walk to my door and open it, 
a clear indication for him to leave when I thought more on it. The final two I have selected will be in for a shock. I'm going to rid myself of those who stand in my way. The headmaster raised two bushy eyebrows and gave a smug smirk when he heard it. He stood, walked toward me, and stood uncomfortably close, his hand on my shoulder, and at first I thought he was going to try to kiss my lips. Instead, it landed on my forehead. I'm proud of you, son. Get rid of them. They are holding you back. I smiled, waited for him to leave, and lay on my back in bed, staring up at the ceiling, and knew what I had to do. A knife beside me. Night time finally came. The moment of truth. I didn't go out to hunt for a new victim. The only light that entered the room was the moon. I lifted the blade and walked to the great hall. They were all there, present, and the other members beside the three looked at each other in confusion. I walked toward my father, not of my blood, but of my heart. I stared into his eyes, through the mask, my hand on his shoulder, a tear of sadness in my eyes, and hopes that God would accept him despite everything. He knew what was coming. His fingers gripped my shoulder and leaned close, almost pulling him into a hug. One for love, I said. His grip loosened, and he accepted his fate. I plunged the knife into his heart, once, twice, and he gurgled blood from his mouth. He tried to speak to me. Mother let out a cry of joy, now free from the marriage and one step closer to power. She clapped her hands and I heard the whispers. Well done, my son. The headman now hid nothing and ignored the gasps of the other members. He spoke with his booming voice that echoed inside the large building, arms wide and inviting me to stand on the podium beside him. Still coated in the blood of the man who raised me, I walked to stand alongside him, and the gathered cult gazed up at us, smiling and clapping with approval. He silenced them with a simple gesture of his hand. Now, free, you may rise and take your position of being my second... You have proven yourself, and I believe after you have taken the third life, you are ready. He wrapped his arm around me. I gestured to my mother for her to come and stand with us. A chance to bask in the glory. I barely had to say anything to her. She practically leapt up onto the stage and wrapped her arm around me. This time, she kissed me on the mouth, and I had to grin and bear it. Not long now. I name him my son, my real son, as my heir. He raised my hand, and this went smoother than I could have imagined. I have one more before I fully join. I pulled my mother close, raised the knife up high, and she realized her time had come. She kicked me in the shins, striking my face and tearing the skin down with her fingernails. How dare you? I fucking gave birth to you. She screeched, angry and afraid. One through hatred, I called out. The headmaster laughed, and none of them tried to stop me. Captivated. Go on, son. Take her life and join us. At the last moment... I turned my wrist and dove it into his neck. A burst of blood in the air. The one who had caused all this suffering for my family. I didn't want him to end his reign painlessly. He had to suffer. Well... He retched, a hand covering the gaping wound and choking. Done, son. I'll be seeing you soon. The last part turned into a lingering demonic growl as the life left his eyes. What the hell did that mean? Thank you for listening and delving with me into the dark together. 
Please remember to leave a thumbs up and subscribe if you feel so inclined. The more engagement this video gets, the more YouTube will push my content to others. Thus, the following will grow. All stories read in this channel will be available on Spotify, iTunes, and just about everywhere else. Links in the description. Thank you for listening and feeding the cause. We'll be seeing you.